Good evening. Thanks for being with us. I'm Leland Bitter. 60 years ago this summer, the Soviets built a wall separating East and West Berlin. Tonight, there is a similar wall separating tens of thousands between rescue by the American military or possible execution by the Taliban. These are images from the Kabul airport where American soldiers and Marines are under orders not to leave or protect the thousands of men and women and children on the outside from continuous attacks by gangs or terrorists. Not to go out and protect Americans either. Just think for a moment the desperation. We want to take this video full so you can see it. A mother must have had, this is what you're watching, to hand her baby over, up the wall, likely to never see that baby again because she knows the American soldiers atop that wall gives her child a better chance than she ever could. That will be an enduring image. As for the Americans still stuck in Afghanistan, the State Department says they don't even have a definitive count of how many there are, but estimate them at about 7,000. Remember, Afghanistan is the size of Texas, and anybody who wants out must get to the Kabul airport on their own. The area in red there is all controlled by the Taliban. It's a dangerous journey under normal times. Today, Taliban checkpoints and roving gangs of recently released terrorists just add to the danger and the problems. Both the State Department and the Pentagon today said they aren't able to guarantee anybody, including American safety, en route to the airport to get a plane out. Instead, saying that they were in touch with the Taliban to secure the safe passage of Americans and others. We have this story covered from all angles. Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin commanded Delta Force in the 1980s, has negotiated with terrorist regimes like the Taliban. Be with him in a minute. Dave Sears, former SEAL commander, who has organized rescue missions for those trapped behind enemy lines. But we start with News Nation's Kelly Meyer in Washington, where her sources say the Pentagon mouthpieces are ignoring the ground truth. Kelly, good evening. Good evening. And evacuation efforts more difficult than they want to admit. And today, the Pentagon tried to paint things as under control, but my sources tell me it is anything but. We're seeing new video of U.S. troops firing tear gas at Afghans near the Kabul airport. One lawmaker told me today that a group of Afghan translators that helped U.S. military from his district were executed before they could make it out. The Pentagon saying today the area is secure and things are operational. Yet U.S. troops are firing warning shots to control the crowds. But it, it is the Taliban keeping people from even getting to the airport to evacuate. The U.S. urging them to allow the departure of those wanting to leave. The Pentagon spokesperson dodging my questions today on whether U.S. forces will protect those trying to get to the airport. Is there any behavior by the Taliban towards U.S. citizens or Afghans trying to reach the airport that would mean U.S. troops would have to protect them? Have any red lines been communicated to the Taliban? We haven't seen any, uh, any hostile interactions between the Taliban and our people, and we certainly and we haven't seen them impede uh, or har harass or obstruct the movement of American citizens from the environs into the airport. Again, Leland, we have sources saying the exact opposite of that. And as evidence of that, the U.S. wants to airlift 9,000 people out of Afghanistan per day. They've only been able to move 7,000 in just the past six days. That's 11 percent of what they set out to do. And not even all of those 7,000 are U.S. citizens. Some could be from the U.K. or elsewhere. Yeah, and at times we're hearing they don't even know who they're airlifting uh, exactly. All right, uh, both the Pentagon and the DOD admitted they don't even know how many Americans right now are left inside Afghanistan. President Biden says that we're going to stay until they get every American out. But at this rate, they're certainly not going to get everyone out by the August 31st deadline, right? Well, that was the most stunning part of this press briefing, Leland Kirby, saying essentially the Taliban has to approve if the U.S. can stay beyond the deadline to get everyone out. Take a listen. If and when there's a decision to change that, uh, then obviously that would require additional conversations uh, with the Taliban uh, as well. But I don't believe that those conversations have happened at this point. You kind of have to feel, feel bad for Kirby because he's the only one from the administration that has actually been coming out and talking to us. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki hasn't been having briefings, and the president hasn't taken any questions from the press, even during his remarks on the situation in Afghanistan. He left before anyone could get a question in. And he heads out to vacation tomorrow. Kelly Meyer in Washington. We'll check back with you, Kelly. Thank you.
All right, with that, we bring in retired Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. Spent 36 years in the Army, began as one of the original members of Delta Force, ultimately commanding special operations teams like those in Afghanistan, finally serving as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence during the last four years of his military career. General, we always appreciate the time. I, I want to play, because it caught my attention. I want to make sure I heard it the same way perhaps you did, uh, that soundbite from Admiral Kirby, now Mr. Kirby, uh, about the Taliban and the August 31st deadline. Take a listen. There has been no decision to change the deadline. And we are focused on doing everything we can inside that deadline to move as many people out as possible. Um, and if and when there's a decision to change that, uh, then obviously that would require additional conversations uh, with the Taliban uh, as well. But I don't. Do we interpret that as the Pentagon believes they need the permission of a terrorist regime to stick around and help evacuate Americans? Leland, I don't see how you can interpret it as anything other than that. Uh, I think it was very clear by, from what he said that uh, we need their permission. Uh, and, and we don't have much in terms of bargaining chips. So, uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what it meant. Should I be as scared of that as I am? Leland, I think this is one of the most, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, heartbreaking experiences of my life is to see what's going on right now and to see the state of our country you have not seen a spokesman yet for this administration that has spoken the truth. We've had half-truths, we've had double-speak, we've had outright lies. And uh, yeah, you should be concerned because uh, America is in deep trouble right now. And those thousands of Americans that are still in the interior there are in really big trouble. And I pray that we'll be able to get in there and get them out. And if the DOD does not have the resources right now, then ask for them. Well, Get the resources you need. Yeah, Gen General Milley, the chairman, basically said, give us the order and we'll do it. It's a policy decision, not a, a capability. I, I, this tweet from President Trump caught my eye. This was back right after the United States assassin assassinated Qasem Soleimani of the Iranians. Let this serve as a warning that if Iran strikes any Americans or American assets, we have targeted 52 Iranian sites some at a very high level and important to Iran and Iran culture and those targets and Iran itself will be hit very fast and very hard. It seems like we could clear all this up and you've dealt with terrorist regimes more than I have, so I'll ask it as a question. If President Biden came out and said, we will hold the Taliban regime personally responsible for the lives and safe being of American citizens and American allies that we wanna get out, would that change the Taliban's behavior? Look, I, I think at this point, our credibility is shot. I, I don't think that they would take that very seriously. We Now, would that have mattered if we had gone into this thing and up front um, made that one of the uh, the conditions here that uh, if, if you don't support us getting our people out here or, or if you don't stay out of the way so we can get them out, uh, then here's what we're going to do. We're gonna use the military option. Of our seven elements of national power, the military option is often and frequently the one that is most feared by our adversaries. Well, and also most respected by our allies who count on us. I know during your time as the uh, Under Secretary of Defense, you spent a lot of time with our allies. Our closest ally, the United Kingdom, seems to feel as though uh, they are perhaps on their own. Take a listen to Theresa May. Was our intelligence really so poor? Was our understanding of the Afghan government so weak? Was our knowledge of the position on the ground so inadequate? Or did we really believe this? Or did we just feel that we had to follow the United States and hope that on a wing and a prayer, it would be all right on the night? She seems more angry than anybody at the White House or the State Department. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, the sad part about it is she's right. And uh, look, that the Brits have been our, you know, one of our strongest allies for a very, very long time. And uh, when you see those kinds of allies beginning to turn on you, uh, you need to recognize that the future uh, is not that bright unless you 
get a leader into the White House that can turn things around and assure our allies that we'll stand with them. And okay. thus far, we have not done that with uh, with our allies in uh, in Afghanistan. Well, you know, the Europeans and NATO especially was so happy when President Biden came in. They thought this was the big reset. You have to wonder if they feel uh, the same way now. Uh, General Boykin, always good to see you, sir. And every time we have you on, our audience enjoys it as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good to be with you. Smarter for the conversation. These are the facts, as Kelly Meyer laid out. President Biden spent last week at Camp David on vacation. He gave one 15-minute statement on Afghanistan Tuesday. Didn't take questions. He talked about COVID yesterday. Didn't take questions. The press didn't see him today, and he's going on vacation tomorrow for the weekend. So what's the strategy here? Niall Strange, White House columnist for The Hill. Niall Standage, pardon me, sir. Um, is this a strategy, or is this just sort of the White House in denial? Well, look, I mean, I think the White House clearly, Leland, would like to turn the page from this. The problem, of course, is that you cannot turn the page while you're still enmeshed in a crisis. They haven't been able to put the crisis out yet. You know, we are all caught up with those very dramatic images that you have shown earlier in the broadcast. And so this idea that you can talk about COVID or really anything else as the president of the United States at this point, I think that's a bad and false strategy. So Biden approval rating, this was taken a couple of days ago, so you have to think that it haven't baked in the really bad images into this poll. 49.4% approved, 44% disapproved. First time he's under 50%. Uh, that would be perhaps troubling to the White House. But then you look at these poll numbers. Overall, would you say the war in Afghanistan was worth fighting or not worth fighting? All adults not worth fighting 62% of Republicans, 57%, Democrats, 67%, not worth fighting. Uh, if this goes away soon enough, which it might when the last Americans leave from the front pages of the New York Times and from our broadcast, sadly, uh, does it matter? Maybe the Biden administration can count a win on this for getting us out. I think this is an absolutely vital point, Leyland. And what it really goes to is the difference between the underlying view of American involvement in Afghanistan and the execution of the withdrawal. Most Americans of either party or of no political allegiance have no real appetite for prolonging the American involvement in a 20-year war. That, though, is a different question from whether people react uh, with horror to this kind of debacle that we have seen, where there has been such a chaotic pullout. I think from the White House's perspective, the danger is that the flawed execution of the withdrawal raises other questions about the overall competence of the administration. That's where the domestic political danger lies for the president. Yeah. Chuck Todd over at MSNBC said that, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase here, but basically said, no longer can we say that Trump was the incompetent one and Biden brought competency back after seeing what happened. This would be the, the question though, what price or what is the White House most worried about? So far, no Americans have died. The video has been horrific. We've seen that. The humanitarian crisis is horrific. No Americans are dead yet. So far, there's no hostage videos of Americans being held. It's all what might happen. If President Biden's able to get every American out, as he says he will, and does it without any American casualties, uh, does he get to take a victory lap? Conversely, if that doesn't happen, what are the dangers? I don't think he gets to take a victory lap, but I do think it will be a relief to him and to the people around him if he's able to seem to reassert control over the, the pullout from Afghanistan. That is not the case now. I think he has been hurt by this episode. But as you yourself pointed out, if no Americans are killed, and of course that's the outcome that we all hope for, that there aren't fatalities here, then obviously that will be a relief to the president. And, you know, people in America have lots of other things to think about, be yeah. that COVID, be that the economy, all of those other issues will reassert themselves, I think. The, Amer the American public has a, a bad case of ADD, um, and oftentimes that can be used to the advantage of the White House. Uh, Niall, always good to see you. We'll be reading your columns in The Hill. Thanks, Leila. Pleasure. Nice to see you again. Well, while British and French troops are heading into Kabul on what they're called gun runs to escort their citizens to the airport and safety, U.S. troops are bunkered down at Kabul's airport. Not because they want to, because that's where they have been ordered to do. 
Republican Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas released a statement that says, in part, it's time for President Biden to authorize the military to stop this rolling humiliation, expand the perimeter at Kabul airport, and rescue Americans trapped behind enemy lines. Anything less amounts to an abandonment of our fellow Americans and a shameful abdication of duty in a moment of crisis. Dave Spears sent 20 years as SEAL serving as a team commander, planned many rescue missions just like the ones the senator is talking about. Also the author of Smarter Not Harder, 17 Navy SEAL Marxisms to Elevate Critical Thinking and Prosper in Business and Life. Dave, good to see you. Uh, all right, so what message is it sending to the Taliban right now that the Brits and French are going in to get people out and the Americans aren't? Yeah, not a good one. I, I don't understand how, I mean, the Brits and the French are going to put they, they will not leave somebody behind. They go after, they have, you know, the French have the experience in Algiers, British have had it in different areas as well. They definitely, I worked with them down in Basra. I mean, they did not take kindly to anybody threatening their people. And we need to demonstrate some strength here. I know that there is absolutely risk in going out and doing that, but you need to kind of push those boundaries and let the Taliban know that it is through deterrence, credible deterrence. I mean, General Blank had said it. it the credibility, though, is in question. We've got about 6,000, as I understand, we got 6,000 troops uh, in Kabul, and obviously the Pentagon doesn't telegraph all the assets they have sometimes. But is the footprint, the American footprint, big enough, and do we have enough assets on the ground to safely even do this outside of the airport if we wanted to? What's it look like? Well, I'm, I'm not privy to the whole, what the Taliban situation is either. I mean, they say that they have 75,000 people is what, you know, I've heard through the news or from President Biden. Is that 75,000 spread throughout the country? I mean, they've always gotten all these numbers wrong anyway. So it could be 7,500 in Kabul. It could be 75,000. It could be 150,000 throughout the country with recruits they picked up. Don't know. So unless you get a good sense through intelligence, which we've shown that we're terrible at apparently, uh, then you have a hard time setting up your defenses. It takes a, an airport's a big facility, a big yeah. area with a lot of vulnerabilities. So guarding that perimeter takes a lot of people. You're talking shifts, and then you have to have overhead assets. And Kabul Airport is terrible for defense. It's surrounded by urban areas on one side that's really hard. Like when Senator Cotton says, push out the perimeter, very difficult to push the perimeter out into the urban areas. You're talking about taking small houses, and it's kind of an impoverished wow. area right there. So Yes, you can go and you'd be ready to fight big time. I mean, you got to need some overhead assets, but you got to be ready to. Uh, and now the Taliban has got. On. Now the Taliban has a whole new cache, billions of dollars worth of U.S. weapons that conceivably could be used against uh, U.S. forces if they wanted to. Uh, they're speaking of sort of what to do on the ground and how dangerous the situation at Kabul Airport is. General Milley, the chairman, was asked about perhaps retaking Bagram Air Base to give us a second footprint there or foothold in the country. Take a listen. Is there any thought of retaking Bagram in order to expedite this evacuation? And if not, why not? Um, I won't. I, I, good question. Great question. But I'm not going to discuss branches and sequels off of our current operation. I'll just leave it at that. Good question. Great question. Seem to be, I'm just waiting for the order. Yeah. I I can't tell. I mean, honestly, so many people need to be fired. General Milley at the top of the list, SecDef at the top of the list. I mean, this is a catastrophic failure, regardless of what you think. It's a failure. It's under their watch. You need new leadership that people have confidence in. And they can't sit there and say, hey, it's the commander in chief who ordered me to do this. Well, you can still prepare and have pieces in place. I mean, I would tell the Taliban, hey, you, you kill one American. We find out about it. We don't know that an American hasn't been killed yet. But we find out about it, and I'm coming in the bottom with 10,000 troops, and I'm never leaving. Huh. You know, I mean, tell the Taliban they need to understand that you are credible and that you are going to bring the hammer down. Bagram's much easier to defend. It's got open fields around it. The mountains are spread out quite a bit, quite a ways. It's got less populous around it, whereas Kabul is kind of, you know, it just northeast seems like a, of the city. It's hard to defend. It just seems like the administration is loath to commit any more troops or expand the footprint because they want out. Uh, so badly. Uh, Dave, it's always good to talk to you. We appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Leland. Good right, talking to you. Thank you. Coming up, they've risked their lives to help the U.S. Now they feel abandoned. We're going to introduce you to one woman trying to get the translators who helped American forces to safety. But first, he's become the public face of President Biden's messy exit from Afghanistan. 
we're going to discuss National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan's actions. Perhaps good job. Welcome back. We have spent the past week reporting on the unmitigated disaster in Afghanistan. It's important to separate the policy ending America's longest war from how that policy was implemented. Jake Sullivan becomes public face of Biden's crisis on Afghanistan, writes the Hill newspaper. Sullivan, a Minnesota native whom Clinton, meaning Hillary Clinton, referenced as a once in a generation talent and potential future president. 44 year old worked for Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, now President Biden's national security advisor. That's a key role that gives him unfettered access to the president. Joining us now, Mark Jacobson, Assistant Dean for Washington Programs at Syracuse University, worked for Democratic Senator Carl Levin, and also worked with NATO in Afghanistan. Uh, we appreciate you being here, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. We can all agree that what's happened in Afghanistan over the past week has been a disaster. It's been an embarrassment. Uh, it's been horrible for the United States, worse for the, for the Afghanis who helped the United States. Uh, does Jake Sullivan deserve the blame? Actually, I think President Biden deserves the blame uh, yeah, but, 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 more than anybody else. Uh, well, these fair, are fair. his calls in the end. But but uh, but look, I, I think Jake, I think the Secretary of Defense, I think the Secretary of State, I think General Milley all deserve a, you know, a lion's share of, of the responsibility for missing this. Now, uh, Jake Sullivan has a special role, and, and I think it's worth considering. Is, this, is he in a position where perhaps uh, he can no longer serve the president effectively? Is he over his head? Uh, perhaps doing a job like this, and, and maybe he needs to resign. Uh, on, on the yeah, other the hand, I, I think uh, your previous guest was absolutely right. There are people who need to be fired, and I think that's one of the things people are, are well, most people are focused on getting at the Afghans out right now, but uh, when you take a breath, you're trying to think, well, um, who's responsible for what we did wrong, and are we talking about people getting fired, or are we talking about people resigning? It's so rare, especially these days, to hear members of the president's own party, and this was true during the Trump administration, calling uh, an action by the president a disaster and saying he needs to be held responsible and people need to be fired. And you're not the only one. Brett Bruin, who was a national security official under the Obama administration, also called for Jake Sullivan's fire. And he said the people plans and process the president has put in place to keep America safe are not working. Those he has chosen for key positions have repeatedly failed to challenge their own assumptions. It sadly led to the most unsuccessful, embarrassing day in the history of the National Security Council. It's important to remember that this is not Jake Sullivan's first rodeo in a disaster. He was a key player in pulling out some of the diplomatic security uh, in Benghazi. Well, I, you look, you're not going to get me to, to, to even compare Benghazi to Fair. Afghanistan. This, yeah. this is a... This is a real disaster, not something made up for uh, political purposes. But, but look, the, the point's the same. This is an interesting time. We have uh, Democrats criticizing a Democratic president. I think that's how it should be. I would rather have seen many more Republicans criticize Donald Trump for the policy on Afghanistan. You're seeing a truly unified uh, uh, criticism of President Biden's policies. And, and that should tell you something. Uh, it should tell you that uh, our senators and representatives are actually thinking through what are, the, what are the problems. And more importantly, what are the obligations we have to the Afghan people that we as uh, individuals who fought over there feel we have to people who uh, saved our lives at times. Uh, you know, so, but it's, I think, it's look, interesting look at the reading, you say sort of universal condemnation. You're right. It's, it's rare that you happen. Ralph Peters talked about Jake Sullivan uh, on this program a couple of days ago. Here's what he said. Illustrated, a person can be intelligent, articulate, and utterly unable to rise to the moment. He was speaking about this soundbite. Take a listen. The Taliban have informed us that they are prepared to provide the safe passage of civilians to the airport, and we intend to hold them to that commitment. All right, he, he sounds like he's a true believer in the policy. Does he really think anybody takes him seriously in that comment? You know, we, we talk about the policy being an unmitigated disaster. I have been openly critical of how bad uh, the public affairs dimension of this has been. You look at the body language of those people at the podium, whether it's at the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House. This stuff is a really hard sell. And I think there are a lot of people who are getting uh, chalk on, uh, on their feet from being close to that line between truth and lies. I mean, they're trying to, to really spin things. Remember the first week, uh, Admiral, uh, retired Admiral John Kirby, this isn't a non-combatant evacuation operation. Yes, it is. This is exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, these are the type, or we're not abandoning the Afghans. There's not a single Afghan 
and that country who doesn't feel that we are abandoning them right now. So I, I just well, I maybe, want maybe them without to be the, with the exception with of us. the Taliban, they seem to be celebrating. Well, the Taliban, of course, are celebrating. Yeah. I mean, this is a uh, but you know, it's it's. It's really interesting. I mean, you can say things up there that are factually correct, but that are utterly misleading. And, and I expect more out of this administration. Uh, look, Ralph Peters uh, is, is spot on. We have some of the most brilliant foreign policy minds uh, of my generation up there right now. Uh, people who, re and they're experienced as well, but what they're showing is they're forgetting all of this. I mean, I don't know what has happened, uh, but but this has really shattered my confidence uh, and, and well, a Mark, whole you don't, cohort of individuals. Yeah. You, you, you don't seem to be alone in that assessment. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, appreciate your candor. We'll have you back. Good to see my you. My pleasure. Please know that adopting you was one of the best things I ever did in my life. When we come back, Chicago remembers police officer Ella French, murdered in cold blood last week. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they metastasize. And we have maintained the ability to have an over-the-horizon capability to take them out. We don't have a military in Syria to make sure that we're going to be protected. Oh, boy. We do have military. 900 members of the United States military in Syria. So... Is it concerning, perhaps, that the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief, doesn't either know, realize, or remember that we have 900 Americans fighting in Syria? Maybe it's gaffes like that that inform us why the White House press shop is so protective of the President. Take a look at this full screen with a tweet from former White House reporter Mark Noller. By Mark's count, Mr. Biden has only done nine interviews, two of which were with George Stephanopoulos, a former official in the Clinton administration. Meanwhile, by comparison, at this time, President Trump had done 50 interviews. President Obama was at 113. Joining us now, two people very familiar with dealing with optics and communications battle at the White House. Johanna Mosca worked for the Obama administration. Alyssa Farr for the Trump administration at one point had uh, the job of defense se press secretary, which is now perhaps an unenviable job for Scott Kirby. We'll get to that uh, in a minute. But uh, Alyssa, start with you. Uh, how do you forget that we have 900 troops in Syria? Well, not only that, Leland, uh, President Biden was critical when we had this uh, Turkish incursion into Syria back in 2019 under the Trump White House. Um, and was somebody who then was fine putting out statements criticizing our response. So he was aware at that time, seems unaware under his own administration. But look, there's been kind of this back and forth about should he be talking more? Does he need to give remarks? In my opinion, the time has almost passed. It's actually almost better to get the operational updates from the Pentagon, the diplomatic updates from the State Department, rather than just have Biden out there saying God knows what and not even having a command of the facts. And by the way, it's not just the U.S. media and American public he's dodging. He's dodging America's allies. He apparently dodged calls for 30 hours from Boris Johnson. So this is an unmitigated disaster. Johanna, does, is Alyssa right that now that he's been sort of unseen, unquestioned on Afghanistan, he's going to go on vacation this weekend, that sort of a win for the White House press shop? I, I don't think that anyone considers this a win. Look, I, we have both been in Afghanistan. All three of us have been in Afghanistan. I was there with President Obama seven weeks after I delivered my son. And I remember then, it was 2012, I, I wanted to go home. And I remember that there were so many troops who didn't have that option. And there were so many problems then that we knew were ongoing. I mean, there were reports of our military officers complaining about the Afghan military officers and them having to look the other way when there were abuses with children. And so, you know, to look back and think that this was all perfect and that we had secured peace for people in Afghanistan, I think is a little rewriting history. Yeah. On the, the optics of this interview, I think ABC is putting out the snippets that they want, just the same as Leslie Stahl and CBS did when Donald oh, oh, Trump. Jo Johanna, you can't, po you can't possibly possibly say that the George Stephanopoulos, who the joke was, had a office in the Obama White House. Okay, you cannot possibly say that he was editing things to be hurtful to President Biden. Come on. 
let's let's be clear. He had actually the press secretary's office of the first female press secretary, as I understand it. So, you know, it, when he was in the Clinton White House, he actually was not part of our White House. I remember, I think it was. I didn't say he, I didn't say he was part of it. I said the joke was is that he was so close to the Obama White House. The joke was he had an office there. But go ahead. Well, <laughs> I, I I will say that's not my experience, but okay. uh, I I do also think that. You know, with these these interviews, we've seen for presidents get progressively more dug in, and I think it has well, to do. Johanna, with there's a simple if there's a simple way to do that, just hold a live press conference. Simple way well, to get around the the bites interviews. He he's he, at this point in time. I think the exactly what Alyssa said. You want the people who have all of the information, giving all of the information from those podiums, and I think that Biden was addressing the. Um, you know, unfortunate images. And I think the answer he should have given was that that image of so many people clinging to a United States Air Force, you know, he, we have a giant image of the United States on the side with people clinging because they want an empathetic America. And we have seen for a long time too many people turn their backs to the globe. And I think we're going to see it again because we're going to, you know, Congress says now that they're all on the side of Afghanistan, but they were not actually on the side of military intervention in Syria. And they actually have made it more difficult. Stephen Miller made it more difficult. A number of people have made it more difficult. You know, it's difficult. interesting you bring up Stephen Miller's name because he's part of the next part of this conversation, which is members of the sort of Trump orbit, if you will, who are now talking about not taking the Afghan translators, the people who risk life and limb to protect our soldiers, uh, now they're saying, hey, we shouldn't take them because it's going to turn America into some cesspool of immigrants. Uh, the headline from The Hill, GOP riff opens up over Af resettling Afghan refugees. Alyssa, I know this is something that you're powerful, powerfully uh, involved in. You think it's a problem for the GOP? So I think it's overstated. I, I, I called out Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, and some of the folks who have been saying, should we resettle them here? Of course we should. They were co-located, serving alongside American forces. They were vetted by the U.S. military. We have a moral obligation to do that. But I actually think it's overstated. The Hill had some polling that found that about 70 percent of Americans support bringing Afghan refugees who served, especially translators and interpreters, who served with the U.S. military and their families to the U.S. So this is something where there's going to be that wing of the Republican Party that wants to go fully nativist against any sort of refugees or immigration, but I don't think it's the overarching number. I know it's certainly, <laughs> certainly not the overarching numbers, it's just whether the, whether the rift in the optics create a problem for the GOP. At, this, at the same time, the rift in the optics inside the Democratic Party might create a problem. Uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, unseen for the past six days, not standing next to the president during his speech uh, on Afghanistan. We understand that on Monday she's going to be going to Vietnam. Uh, boy, Johanna, as a communications person, would you be worried that there's a, a little too much symbolism and irony with her in Vietnam as we're withdrawing from Afghanistan? I, I don't think she needed to be at the president's side. President Biden was not at President Obama's side when we did the live address to the nation on the anniversary of Osama bin Laden's death. Well, yeah, but jo Johanna, okay, come on. It's a little different when doing the address to the nation about that versus all of a sudden people falling off of planes and Americans having to go back into Afghanistan to rescue people. Those are a little <laughs> different situations. Well, let's, let's be clear, though. They want to hear from the president. Okay. You're saying you're Stuff. People want to hear from the president, so he's, you know, managing those expectations. I think they had this plan, this trip planned a long time ago. Should they reconsider it? Probably, but are they going to? At this point, it seems like it's going forward. Um, so I guess we're going to have to see what she has to say when she's there. Yeah, we'll see if actually she she gives any availability to reporters. We'll see if anybody able, is able to get a question, and they haven't with President Biden. He hasn't been willing to take him. Uh, Alyssa. I want to come full circle from your career that went through Capitol Hill, then to the Pentagon, vice president's office, and then ending with President Trump. Uh, you're at the Department of Defense. Um, I'm wondering sort of how you're watching these cringeworthy press conferences of John Kirby and either the Secretary of Defense or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, you have to read on their faces. They just do not enjoy defending these policies. Absolutely not. Um, I, I worked with many of those men, Chairman Milley, someone I personally advised when I was at DOD. And I know well enough from my White House perspective that at the end of the Trump administration, 
He was one of the active voices advising the former president to keep a very small residual force in Afghanistan. He was making the argument that even with a 1,500 to 2,000 person force, you could hold the peace and over time scale down to even smaller. So I know that behind his teeth, he's grinning and bearing because he doesn't operationally agree with this. Um, you know, I and John Kirby, someone I think extremely highly of, but they're in an untenable position. They're having to defend a terrible policy decision and then terrible operational execution, which DOD usually prides itself on. At least we're going to get things done the right way. And they've been un unable to do that. And just one point I want to make, because Johanna hit on this, is most Americans agree we should withdraw from Afghanistan. However, virtually none think we should have withdrawn the way that we did, this disastrous, untimely, without looking out for American citizens and country, without evacuating Afghans who helped us. That's the problem. And by the way, leaving arms in the hands of the Taliban and empowering them for decades to come. Yeah, but but Alyssa, I mean, the truth is this was 20 years in the making. And, you know, this was a number of people who just did not take the step to jo actually. Johanna, I, I've got to run. I'm up against a hard break, but I promise that when you girls come back next it's week. It's a bad marriage. Yes. It's a bad marriage. It's a bad breakup. It's going to be bad. I, 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 like the divorce, I like the divorce analogy. When you come back yeah. next week, uh, you get the first question, all right? Uh, all right. Thank you both. Good. Ladies, good to Bye. see you. Up next, we're introducing you to an American woman who is leading the effort to save Afghan interpreters. But first, we want to take a moment to remember the life and service of fallen Chicago police officer Ella French. You might remember we introduced you to her last week. She was shot and killed during a traffic stop earlier this month. The man charged with killing her is a convicted felon out on parole from a sweetheart deal with Chicago prosecutors. Mourners, including Mayor Lori Lightfoot, former Mayor Richard Daley, and a whole slew, as well it should have been, of who's who in Chicago came to pay their respects. There were so many people who came, they had to wait 30 minutes to start the funeral. First, you're going to hear from Chicago's Cardinal, and then you will hear from Ella French's mother. Ella took the time to know others, to connect with them on the level of our common fragile humanity and understood that she too always had more to learn, that no one should pretend to put the period at the end of a sentence of a person's life or worse, claim that they could not learn from others or change for the better. We sat and played and talked, at least I did, a while to get to know each other. Then you smiled. It was a smile that lit up your face, my home, and captured my heart. I knew then that, God willing, you would be my daughter forever. We're going to leave you with the sound of the Chicago Police Department bagpipers escorting Ella French out of the church. We want to explain to you why the Afghan interpreters that America is trying to save matter. They risk their lives to help America and our allies, and now they're trapped as the Taliban takes over Afghanistan. We want to show you some pictures coming directly from an interpreter who worked with U.S. soldiers on the ground. Right now, he's on the wrong side of the wall, and you can see the desperate faces and scenes of interpreters and their families trying to leave the country as they are beaten back by Taliban terrorists. Now, one American woman is leading the fight to try and bring them to safety. Join us now, Jen Wilson, the COO of Army Week Association. Jen, boy, you're doing great work. Uh, DOD and uh, the State Department say they've got this under control. Do they? Um, honestly, we were able to get more people out on the what we're calling the digital Dunkirk um, when the LGF, the Afghan Security Forces, the ANA, was on the gate prior to the Americans got, getting there. The bureaucracy, the, the quote-unquote lists that you're hearing about, I mean, trying to get these guys into the gate is almost impossible right now. We see the pictures that you've sent. We also have some video uh, at night, and it, it is surreal and scary as all get out. I've never been to Afghanistan, but from my time in Libya and Egypt, I remember being in scenes like this, and it is phenomenally scary. They're with their families. They're trying to get in. How are you communicating with them? 
I am constantly in contact with these guys on WhatsApp, Signal, uh, Instagram uh, Messenger, Facebook Messenger. Um, I really, I've been glued to my phone for uh, 96 hours now, working since Sunday to get all of these guys out. Uh, we originally had a list of uh, 62. We've gotten, and then that it keeps growing, honestly, but we've gotten 30 out so far, just well, attached to me. Obviously, there are hundreds. You're doing the Lord's work. This video also comes from one of the interpreters you're working with who's caught on the wrong side of the fence. Is it as easy as calling the State Department or the Pentagon and saying, hey, we got these guys, go out and get them or come let them in? So the process is supposedly, according to, to, to the American forces, you put them on a list, the list goes to the gate, they're calling out the names over this loudspeaker and they're supposed to be able to go in. Um, that is not working. We don't know who's calling out these names. We don't know what list they're reading from. The way I'm getting people in is having the, our interpreters go to the guards at the gate, get their contact information, either put me on the phone with them and then I become I've never served in the military, but I'm Sergeant First Class Jen Wilson with the 82nd Airborne U.S. Army. These guys need to be let through, and it's worked. I got 14 out that way. That is fantastic. And I, got, it, I mean, it's incredible that it works, but it did. <laughs> uh, and the, another one, it was I had a lieutenant colonel on call, and he took the call, and he got some out that way. That, that's it's crazy that that's how we're doing it. it yeah, it, it's absolutely crazy, but it's it, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Um, what do you, what's sort of the feeling here? Is it getting better or is the situation getting worse and it's getting harder? The desperation for them is getting exponentially worse because they're, they know they're being hunted and they know they can't get in the, in the airport. So they're stuck in this middle ground. Um, so we have a couple very high value targets that the Taliban is after that we've stashed in, in safe houses and we're wow. waiting for a secure, guaranteed way into the gate. Uh, one of them is Carl, who have, is on my social media. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is amazing. He's, Jen, he's the interpreter I'm, for a very close I hate to friend do of this mine. Because this is the best interview we've had all night. We're going to have to let you go. But come back and talk to us, and we want to follow sure. your journey and their journey through this, all right? Sure. All right. Amazing work. Jen, thank you. Thank we'll you. We'll be right back.